And okay, hi guys. So I want to um, touch on a few things. There's been, you know, just to talk about some social justice, talk about um, different analyze, ways that this is analyzed with this myth. Um, the first thing I'd like to share with you guys is, let me just go ahead and share my screen. I had the benefit when I was in college of studying under Dr. Leonard Mueller, and um, he is friends with a gentleman at Harvard named Gregory Naj, uh, N-A-G-Y. He, they, I mean, the, the work that they do in Hellenic studies, but specifically for literature, mythology is unparalleled. So um, I want to highly recommend reading the hymn to Demeter, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, um, which I have projected on my screen. And if you just Google Homeric hymn to Demeter, Gregory Naj, you'll find it very easily. It should be the first link that you have um, shown up there. Um, and so I want to share some things that are about this myth. And I want I want to encourage you, you know, you're graduating now from the Delairs and you should read the, I believe this translation is about 500 lines. So really just take, yeah, 495. Um, this is a beautiful story. Um, and something I like about this translation is that he really tries to stick to this idea of um, the language and the rhythm and the, he, he, you'll see he inserts a lot of Greek words in there. Um, and I, I don't know, I just think he does a very good job culturally sticking to the original um, Greek. So, um, yeah, take some time in your own time to read this. And I'm just going to, when I read this in college, I took some notes and I want to, you know, kind of go through these and let you know a bit of the things about it. Now, first off, we all know that, um, or hopefully you're thinking about this now, you know, Persephone was not a willing participant in this situation, right? She, what, I mean, the Delaire does say she's kidnapped, but I think that, what we can surmise from this is probably a bit more than just a simple kidnapping. You know, um, Hades wanted her in the way that, you know, um, men today want women willing or not, or even women wanting men, it happens both ways. Um, and so that's kind of the, I guess, um, warning here is that if you're someone who maybe has unfortunately and sadly gone through a um, experience of sexual harassment, rape, or, you know, anything like that, this could be a very difficult myth for you. Like I said before, we also do have to remember when studying this myth that we're learning about the way that the Greeks examined the world that they lived in. And one of the things that um, Dr. Mjolnir taught me and the other students in this class to think about is, you know, the impact of the Eleusinian mysteries on the growth of womanhood, womanhood in the Greek world. And um, the word mysteries comes from actually the Greek word mustes, which is initiate, and mysteria, which means the initiatory rites, and then we actually get our word mythology from this. These initiatory rites, these mysteria, these set these women apart, and it was, a, it was a privilege to be a part of the Eleusinian mysteries, and it brought these women together in their own significant way, a form of ritual currency, if you will. Um, and I don't know, it's, I thought it was pretty interesting. So something he made us think about is how old was Persephone when all of this happened? Why is it at that moment, Persephone is abducted from Hades. It's the moment when she goes to pick even, she's picking flowers and blossoms. She's the accompany with the daughters of Okeanos and they're all there in their virgin womanhood picking flowers together and I think it shows this fall that she makes kind of a transition to another stage in life. She starts off always by her mother's side, never leaving her side. But then she's out with other girls of her age. Now, 
today with marriage, typically it's a mutual relationship. You go out, you date, you have conversations and you share experiences and you grow in love together. But in ancient Greece, the marriage ritual was actually very different. Um, I think even compared to, you know, I think even the Romans had a slightly better marriage ritual than the Greeks did because it was really about a man going to the father and the father granting permission. So the husband would lead the wife actually away from her father, uh, father's home to his father's home. And then she doesn't go back. They have a special room in the house, even in, in um, the Greek home called the Goinakia, which is literally just a woman's room, almost, you know, the equivalent to like a harem room in the middle in the Near East. It's a very socially and emotionally important time for a young woman. Um, you can't really go back and forth. Once you were married, this was your new family. Today we have it, you know, um, your yourself or your mother or your aunts or your sisters, they can go back and forth. You know, we have a social and emotional attachment to our previous home, but in the Greek world, the woman couldn't always go back and forth. Now Persephone can, which is kind of a nice thing in this myth. And she kind of recycles herself, going from child to adult, adolescence to womanhood, as the years go on. Something that's kind of interesting, you know, thinking about yourself even, when you were a child, you were always with your parents. And then when you became a teenager, um, you started to hang out with adolescents, um, your own group of peers, more likely the same gender as you. You guys can go out and you do things, right? Um, so you have a relationship with your parents or for Persephone's case with her mother, then girls her own age and gender, and then with her husband. This is a switch from a relationship with the people that are the same as you to people that are different from you. And Persephone, we see this as a very brutal shift. Um, and so when it comes to understanding the Ellicinian mysteries, we can think about this as an initiation ritual um, that maybe is recycled. And maybe this is a recurring pattern. Maybe this teaches us the closest thing that we can understand to what these mysteries were about, about splitting the world of life and light to the world of darkness and dead, the world of your mother, you know, the world of your husband. Um, now also remember we talked about it all about go being between future husband and father, you know, women don't really have a choice in the matter. Zeus is the father here. Remember, we have to remember that Zeus is the father of Persephone and he gives her away to his brother Hades. She had no choice in the matter. And maybe women in ancient Greece also, we can learn from this, that they also had no choice in the matter when it came to marriage. And she shrieks. That is something I like about the Dallaire's translation. She does shriek. She is scared. When she makes this transition, it's a terrifying one. And we see this also in um, Gregory Nagy's translation. I'm sorry, the font is so small. But he says, he seized her against her will put her on his golden chariot and drove away as she wept. She cried with a piercing voice. At calling upon her father, Zeus, the son of Cronus, the highest and the best. But none of the mortals heard her voice, right? So we see she's not really a willing participant in this marriage. And that's important to note. Um, and then Demeter goes around looking for her, goes among mortals after she finds out about Hades taking her, and then goes to that place, which the Athenians then set up a sanctuary there at Eleusia. If you keep reading the um, hymn to Demeter, you find, let's see here. You know, she's going over land and sea, looking and looking, but no one's willing to tell her the truth. She's wandering all over the earth. She never drank ambrosia or nectar. She wasn't taking care of herself. She was, as we would say today, maybe a hot mess. Um, and so she transformed. Now, in Delaire's, they say she's kind of like an old woman. Um, but here it just pretty much means, you know, in her grief, 
She did not bathe. She did not eat. She did not drink until actually Hecate comes to her and aids her. Uh, the myth itself expresses a cycle. It's associated with the return from the underworld, with the arrival of spring. Um, and, oh, right. This is what I was going to say a second ago. I'm sorry, I just missed my spot. But <clears throat> just in the exact same way that if you have studied the Iliad, you know about the, tra the traversing of withdrawal and return that Achilles goes through. We start the Iliad um, with Menes, right, with wrath, and then Achilles withdraws from war. In the very same way, Demeter, in the hymn to Demeter, is actually experiencing Menes itself, right? Um, and then she goes into withdrawal, and she hides at Eleusis. But then eventually she does return when her daughter returns. And so we see this link when it comes to Homeric um, tradition. But then also, you know, this, I don't want to call it a rite of passage. I feel like it's the wrong word. But we see that, you know, Persephone is raped. She is married. She becomes an adult. And she becomes the queen of the underworld. And, you know, she, this cycle um, is a part of the same process of withdrawal and return. Her return to life in the springtime to the upper world versus the underworld, it marks that, that seasonal change in the foundation of the mystery religion that is the Eleusinian mysteries. Her attempts, Demeter's attempts were in vain. She was an angry mother because she could not find um, Persephone. And she kind of let the whole world fall apart until, you know, she has that same manus like Achilles. He let the war fall apart in his manus, in his wrath, his divine wrath, right? Even though, you know, Achilles is only a demigod, you know, it is still a divine wrath. And, um, you know, Hades does let Persephone go, but she still has that whole pomegranate thing. Now, remember I said earlier, pomegranates, you think about it, there's something kind of sexual um, about it. It's a fruit with a fleshy exterior that consists of seeds. Um, and it kind of, if you look at it kind of with fuzzy eyes, it kind of does look like something that is rotting. And so it kind of makes sense that it would be the fruit of the dead. And by eating it, she is still tied to that world. Maybe this is also another part of the initiation process for the Eleusinian mysteries. Maybe this is some kind of symbolic way to explain a relationship with life with death and um, I don't know, nobody really exactly has all of the answers here. Great sense of, especially Gregory Nagy, with the, how this myth is fundamentally related to the daily life of the people um, and how all myths are related to the fundamental daily life of the people in um, the ancient world. You know, maybe this initiation, maybe the reason that we love this myth so much is because it has a sort of global everlasting sense. It's problematic. It's difficult to deal with in some parts. We can't take it all lightly. Um, but I think it's a very important myth and a very beautiful one for the very same reasons. I hope that you have a lovely day. Well, let's say.